Hi, my name is Peter Strom. I'm a professor at Rutgers, which is the State University of New Jersey. And what I'd like to talk uh, with you about today is uh, biological treatment of sewage. It may not have been your, your top thing you thought of when you first thought of environmental science, but I want to try to convince you today that it is still something that's very important and very interesting. So uh, before I get into that too much, let me just tell you a little bit about my department. So I'm in the Department of Environmental Science at, at uh, Rutgers, and we actually just celebrated our centennial this past year. Um, we, uh, our department started because of a fly problem at a sewage treatment plant in Plainfield, New Jersey. And uh, the, these flies are psychota flies, they're smaller than house flies, pretty neat looking, actually look uh, a lot like B1 bombers, uh, the ones that I've seen, not quite exactly like the picture uh, that's shown there. Um, but they, um, they're also called filter flies or actually urinal flies is another name for them. Um, and uh, they would form these large, uh, clouds around the sewage treatment plant and the neighbors would complain and the treatment plant workers would get upset uh, because every time they'd open their mouth to say something a fly would go in and I can actually tell you from personal experience that they don't taste very good they're they're pretty bitter actually so they went to the experiment station the group of scientists at Rutgers uh, which is the land-grant college for New Jersey and um, they, they uh, put together a team to investigate this problem. And based on the success they had in controlling the, that uh, fly problem, uh, the state decided to uh, create our department. And that was in 1920 that that occurred. So we actually think we're the oldest department in the world. Uh, if any of you are from uh, North Carolina, you might like to know that uh, Chapel Hill in North Carolina started at about the same time. We think we started uh, one year before them. Um, so our department, of course, has expanded over the years. We've looked at you know, many different types of environmental problems, um, you know, starting with sewage treatment, but quickly spreading to you know, water pollution. And then over the years, adding other things like air pollution, um, you know, solid waste, hazardous waste, uh, climate change, and you know, the whole variety of environmental problems. One thing that hasn't changed is that right from the beginning, our, our department has used what's referred to as an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach uh, to environmental problems. So we, we combine uh, uh, lots of different scientific disciplines, you know, chemistry, biology, microbiology, uh, physics, mathematics, statistics, um, and we combine these with engineering disciplines as well. Um, so we you know, want to investigate these problems and hopefully solve them as well. Uh, and sewage treatment is still one of our interests. It's one of the things that I focus a lot of my time on, in fact. And it's still very important. And, and uh, again, hopefully I'll convince you it's, it's uh, surprisingly interesting. So just a very brief outline. Um, I'm going to talk just very briefly about the importance of, of sewage and industrial wastewater treatment. And then we'll do a little bit on the fundamentals of, of uh, treatment, particularly the biological aspects of treatment. And then what I want to focus mostly on is the ecology of these treatment systems, because I think that's one of the things that's so interesting about them. So first of all, the importance. So here's a report from UNICEF. Uh, it's several years old now, but they looked at the total deaths in children under the age of five worldwide in 2012 and found that that year, tragically, there were still 6.6 .6 million children uh, dying uh, under the age of five. Um, this is much better than you know, it, it once was, but it's still a pretty tragic number. And as you can see, um, uh, you know, a lot of these deaths occur during the first month of life. Uh, but children who survive the first month are still at risk for a number of, of diseases. Pneumonia is the, the largest of those. And of course, others you've heard of like malaria and, and AIDS are on the list. But notice that just diarrhea is you know, the second most important death, uh, cause of death in children between the ages of one month and five years. And uh, actually some of the neonatal deaths are from uh, diarrhea as well. And this is because of poor sanitation. Um, because they don't have good sewage treatment, their water 
becomes highly contaminated, and then is this major cause of death worldwide. So we've been fairly successful in controlling this in the US. Um, and this comes mainly from the 1972 Federal Water Pollution Control Act and, and the 1977 Clean Water Act amendments, uh, which uh, you were know, a major commitment to controlling uh, water pollution in the US. Um, and, and among the many things that this, uh, these laws did, uh, one of the things is it says that you cannot discharge anything to a water body in the US, whether you know, you're a sewage treatment plant or an industrial facility, uh, you can't discharge unless you have a permit. And then of course, in the permit, they'll specify how well that wastewater needs to be treated before you can discharge. The law also universally applied um, a, a fairly high level of treatment. So, so the original sewage treatment was mostly what was called primary treatment, a pretty low level of treatment. But uh, along with those laws, the, the mandate was for this higher level of treatment called secondary treatment. And then another thing that the law did uh, was provide a lot of funding, federal funding for uh, local communities to build sewage treatment plants. And in fact, th this was recognized at the time and for at least several decades afterwards um, as the largest public works project in the history of the world. Um, and that's building sewage treatment plants in the U.S. So it was a larger investment than the Egyptian pyramids or, or uh, um, the interstate highway system, um, and even uh, larger than the investment to put a man on the moon. Um, so this was a major commitment, again, by the people of the United States to, to improve uh, water treatment, uh, wastewater treatment, to, to improve water pollution in our country. And it has been quite successful. Um, and the picture on the right is actually the Raritan River as it flows uh, near, uh, actually flows through the uh, New Brunswick campus. Um, and when I was a grad student uh, at Rutgers, I, I was a TA for a course in which we looked at life in the river and only found two species, a, a small freshwater pollution tolerant snail and leeches. Um, Today we see uh, large numbers of fish and crabs and, and a variety of other things. The, the water is still not suitable for swimming. You can see the sign there, uh, beach closed due to contamination. Uh, so there's still quite a bit of work to be done, but we should take some pride in the progress we've made. It really is a you know, very considerable amount of progress. So another reason why wastewater treatment has become very important uh, in recent years is that we now recognize that we can use treated wastewater uh, to, to help offset some of our water supply. Uh, water supplies are becoming quite scarce in many parts of the world and including in many parts of the US. And um, some areas in the US are now using their treated wastewater uh, as a source of drinking water. The treated wastewater goes into the drinking water plant uh, where it's then further treated for uh, to make it drinkable. So the city of San Diego, for example, is doing that uh, because they're so short on water there. And my son who lives there says the water actually tastes better now than it did when it was uh, Colorado River water was a larger percentage of, of their drinking water. And then a, a final thing in more recent years is becoming uh, even of greater interest is that we also realize that some of those contaminants in wastewater actually uh, are resources, uh, that those materials actually could be used. The phosphate that's present, for example, could be uh, recovered and used as, as fertilizer. And there's a variety of other materials present that potentially also can be used. And so that's become an interest as well. So just a few things about uh, wastewater treatments or some general uh, fundamentals about it. There, there's typically a number of different steps in a sewage treatment plant or an industrial wastewater treatment plant. Um, there's a typically preliminary treatment to start off, which removes large objects, for example. Then there might be primary treatment still, but the requirement now is that we have secondary treatment. That's the minimum requirement in the US. And in some places, greater levels of treatment, uh, referred to as tertiary and advanced treatment are necessary. Um, and the, the permit requirements for all uh, 
sewage treatment plants is that they must remove at least 85% of, of two classes of pollutants. One is the biochemical oxygen demand, which is the organic matter, and then suspended solids as well, which is fine particles. And these plants use uh, processes that normally would occur uh, you know, naturally in a stream, but they're able to uh, do them in the treatment plant so that the stream doesn't suffer uh, while it's uh, performing uh, that treatment. So uh, virtually all secondary treatment is biological treatment, or really it's microbiological treatment. Uh, the trickling filter uh, was invented in 1895. It's a bed of rock, or nowadays sometimes it's a bed of plastic. Um, and wastewater is sprayed over that bed and microorganisms form a biofilm on the rocks, on the surfaces of the rock or plastic. And as the wastewater flows over them, th 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 those microorganisms eat the contaminants. They, they um, utilize those contaminants to meet their uh, growth needs and energy needs. Uh, slightly later, uh, activated sludge process was invented and started to be used. Um, and this is a little different. It's a suspended growth system. The microorganisms grow suspended um, within the uh, wastewater that's being treated. Um, so there's, uh, as you can see on the bottom right there, this, this is a diffused air uh, plant. Uh, so this air is vigorously bubbled uh, into the wastewater to keep the microorganisms well mixed and aerated so that they have plenty of oxygen as well. And there's lots of variations. There's a number of other treatment methods that have been developed over the years, uh, some of which are, are in fairly wide use now. There's some newer ones that are very promising. Uh, but what they all share in common is that they pretty much all are microbiological and they rely on uh, microbes to eat the contaminants or use the contaminants as, as their um, uh, nutrient and, and uh, energy supply. And then after the treatment, we need to, or as a last stage in the treatment, we need to then remove the microorganisms. We don't want to be discharging those. Um, so we remove the biomass as we refer to it. And that's typically, and not always, but it's typically done by uh, settling sometimes referred to as secondary settling for secondary treatment. And as you can see on, on the bottom right, the figure there, the wastewater coming out of secondary treatment looks like stream water. In fact, in some plants, it looks like drinking water. Uh, it's not uh, at that point yet, but it has been greatly cleaned compared to the original wastewater. And over 90% of the organic contaminants have been removed. So biological treatment processes were designed by engineers, originally by civil engineers, and then they be the ones who did wastewater treatment were referred to as sanitary engineers, and now they're called environmental engineers, which is a broader term. Uh, but they developed these uh, processes, um, we call this uh, empirically, they tried things, and if they worked, then they kept doing them, and then they would you know, make modifications and see if that was better, then they would make those changes. So it's, it's basically by trial and error or by, you know, by evidence, by empirical evidence as to what worked and what didn't work. But basically they were considered to be black boxes. Uh, wastewater went in, treated wastewater came out, and we really didn't know what was going on inside. Um, you know, we knew that there was mixing and that there was aeration and so on, but we really didn't know how in any, in any detail how the wastewater uh, be became treated. And of course, uh, over time, we, we wanted to try to understand that uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the, the systems are usually effective, even when we knew very little about how they work. They often worked very well for long periods of time, but some of them would have problems and, and some of them would occasionally have problems. And of course, we want to be able to solve those problems and get back to good treatment levels. And also, it's, it's likely that if we understand the system better, we can get better treatment. We can get the same investment of, you know, of all those um, billions of dollars. We can actually get better treatment from that investment. And we can also do it uh, ongoing way at a lower cost. So, for example, uh, with lower energy costs, which would have both environmental and economic benefits. So, 
as we've come to understand these systems, what we realize is that they are in fact microbial ecosystems. And these are real ecosystems. Um, in the same way that, that you, you know, you, you see the African savanna on a, on a, you know, a nature show on TV and, and learn about that ecosystem. These are also ecosystems, although they're engineered and they're made of concrete and steel. Um, they are still ecosystems. And that's my specialty. I'm an environmental scientist whose specialty is microbial uh, ecology uh, uh, in these engineered systems, in these systems we use for treatment. So that includes sewage and industrial wastewater treatment. Uh, it also includes composting. My PhD, in fact, was on uh, composting, which is a treatment system that's, that's used for solid organic wastes. Um, we've also worked on bioremediation of contaminated soils and contaminated waters, including you know, for fairly hazardous waste, they can still be treated biologically. And we've even done some projects looking at uh, air pollution control using microbial ecosystems, a process called biofiltration to do that. So one thing about all ecosystems, they require energy. If ecosystems don't have inputs of energy, they just gradually uh, fall apart. So what's the energy available in this ecosystem? And of course, sunlight is ultimately the the source of energy for most ecosystems. But, but these systems, even though they're outdoors, there's really very little sunlight entering. What, what's, you know, that, that's not really their source of energy. So let's think for a minute, what is the major component of sewage? And uh, actually it's water. Uh, sewage is 99.9% .9 water. Uh, you know, so next time somebody tells you that something they're selling is 99% pure, you can tell them, well, sewage is actually 10 times purer than that. Um, the the uh, problem with sewage is that it, you know, although it only contains, uh, you know, 0.1% contaminants, those contaminants have a big effect if they get into a stream. So one of the things that we're very interested in with sewage is the biochemical oxygen demand or BOD, which you've probably uh, you know, already studied at, at this point in the semester. But this is a measure of how much organic matter is present. It measures the organic matter present based on how much oxygen it would use up if it got into a stream, or at least uh, using this test that tries to mimic that. And uh, since stream water can only hold nine or 10 milligrams per liter of oxygen, um, you know, if, if we put in uh, 200 milligrams per liter of BOD, uh, which is what typical sewage would have, um, that of course can easily deplete all of the oxygen in the stream, even if it's diluted, uh, you know, uh, 20 fold. Um, so um, that's why we think of sewage as being so highly contaminated. But 200 milligrams per liter of BOD is also 200 parts per million. Um, and so we can ask the question, what percent of sewage is BOD? And we don't normally think of it this way because the percent levels of, of BOD would be very high uh, levels of, of contamination, uh, much higher than sewage. Um, but if we convert it to percent, this is only 0.02% uh, energy source. So if we want to grow microorganisms in the laboratory, we might use a very weak medium uh, such as nutrient agar, but that would be 40 times stronger. That would be 0.8% BOD. And most bacterial growth meteors are, are 10 times higher than that in terms of their, uh, at least five to 10 times higher than that. So sewage, it turns out, is actually a very weak medium uh, for growing bacteria. It does have good levels of nitrogen and phosphorus and so on. So that's nice. But in terms of the basic energy source, it's actually very dilute. And so in this ecosystem, there are all the normal sorts of interactions that you think of in ecosystems. There are predators and there's uh, you know, parasites, there's uh, mutualism, but the main interaction is competition. There's actually not enough uh, food supply present. And so the organisms there have to compete for it. There's relatively little energy available. So most of the organisms in uh, sewage treatment actually end up starving to death. 
um, when we look at the biomass in an activated sludge system, for example, we estimate that only one to 10% of it is actually still alive. That some of it might have come into the plant dead, but a large proportion of it has died in the plant because it was unable to compete effectively. So the organisms that are able to compete effectively, you know, they win this competition and they increase their proportion in the biomass. You know, they be, become the, the more predominant uh, species that are present. The losers, on the other hand, are the ones that can't compete. They can't grow as fast uh, and, and produce as many offspring as, as the winners. And so they decrease in proportion and may be eliminated entirely. And that outcome, you know, who are the winners and who are the losers, that's determined by the environment they're in. And, and that's based on the treatment plant conditions. Now, a lot of the conditions, uh, environmental conditions in a sewage treatment plant are not controlled by the operators of the plant. Temperature, for example, uh, it's too expensive to raise or lower the temperature of water uh, you know, for normal sewage treatment. And so, you know, whatever the temperature is, that's what the organisms are exposed to. And that of course affects who wins and who loses. Uh, another thing that affects them is the contact time. So they spend a certain number of hours in the tank you know, where they're able to feed. Um, and the sewage treatment plant operators can't control that. It's based on how fast the water comes into the plant, the wastewater comes into the plant. So when they originally designed the plant, the engineers designed a specific contact time. But once uh, the plant starts operating, that's really not controlled anymore. And then what wastewater, uh, you know, what's in the wastewater coming in? What organic compounds are present? And, and particularly it varies from treatment plant to treatment plant based on what industries might be in that town. And the treatment plant has relatively little control over what, you know, what comes into the plant. They pretty much have to treat anything that gets dumped into the sewer. Now, some plants are able to control pH. Um, so that's one thing that they sometimes can control. The pH usually stays around neutral, but in some plants it will become acidic with time and, and the plants can then control that. Now some plants can control the dissolved oxygen. So they are aerating in many cases, the, the wastewater, and they may have some control over how much air they provide. Some plants do not. Some plants, um, basically the air is on or off and that's the only control they have. But newer plants, they often try to build in control. Uh, industrial wastewater might not have enough nitrogen or phosphorus in it and, and treatment plants will then add those nutrients. Um, but the one thing that most plants can control and, and, and the way they actually control how successful their operation is, is by controlling what we call sludge age, which is actually the inverse of the growth rate. Uh, so let me just explain this a little more. Um, so if we look at a typical activated sludge flow schematic, we see that the wastewater comes in, the influent comes into a, an aeration tank, and in a typical plant, it'll spend about six hours there. It then goes to a settling tank where the sludge is settled out and the, the clear wastewater now can go on to further treatment. The sludge that settles out gets returned back to the aeration tank because that's the biomass, those are the microorganisms that are actually doing the treatment. So it takes a little while for this to build up over time, but after uh, you know, the first few weeks of operation, we now have an, an, a working activated sludge plant uh, with the sludge getting returned and performing the treatment. So the, the wastewater spends about six hours in the aeration tank, but the biomass gets recycled and then spends another six hours. And then it gets recycled again and spends another six hours. So it can be much older. The sludge age can be much longer than the age of the water in the plant, which would only be you know, six hours. Now, because it keeps growing, because the biomass keeps growing, we do have to waste some of it or remove some of it. That's called waste sludge. But it, what it really means is we're removing a portion of biomass. And uh, the way most plants are operated, um, the, the sludge age, the amount of time that the sludge spends in the system is often three days or, or it's often can be longer than that even. Um, so while the water's only spending six hours, the 
microorganisms are spending three days or longer. But still at that point, that means that we get, uh, you know, 100 generations a year. So the microorganisms completely replace the biomass. If there's, uh, you know, 10 tons of biomass in there today, uh, three days from now, there'll still be 10 tons of biomass in there, but we also would have removed uh, 10 tons of biomass in that period of time. So it's replaced itself every three days. So we get you know, more than 100 generations. And one interesting thing is that that actually provides then, you know, within a few years, that's plenty of time for evolution to have occurred in these systems. And so in some ways, they're like islands, right? That each individual activated sludge plant or other biological wastewater treatment plant is sort of like an island. It's somewhat isolated from other plants. And so evolution can occur in that system. And we can get somewhat unique organisms there, you know, organisms that differ somewhat from those in other treatment plants. So let's look at the organisms just for a minute. So the most important organisms present are the bacteria, and there's lots of different species present. We actually don't know most of the, the species that are present. Uh, they're not very interesting to look at. So, you know, at 100 power on the microscope, they would look something like this, the, you know, basically tiny dots. Uh, this is actually um, an organism that we isolated from activated sludge and grew in a pure culture in the laboratory. So this is a single species, unlike what it would be in activated sludge, where it'd be mixed uh, species present. Now, but if we look at them under high power, they're still all, you know, often not that interesting. They're just basically bigger dots. Um, but they also can form associations and typically inactivated sludge and in, um, uh, um, trickling filters as well, um, they typically form associations. In inactivated sludge, they form what we call flock. So this is a big you know, mass of, of microorganisms, most of them dead, but there are still a bunch of live ones in here. And there's also some just particles that came in with the sewage that are probably stuck in here as well. Um, so that, those are referred to as flock and they can be fairly small or they can be you know, quite large. It can be uh, certainly visible to the eye. The larger ones can be a millimeter uh, in size, although most of them are, are smaller than that. Um, and then we also get another type of association which is called a filament. So th these are uh, bacteria or occasionally fungi, but typically bacteria that have their cells arranged end to end to form a, you know, a single cell wide uh, filament that can be quite long. They actually can be, uh, become long enough that they become visible to the eye as well. There's also all different types of protozoa present. So the simplest protozoa are usually considered to be the flagellates. And so one common one, the genus name happens to be Bodo, uh, but here's a common one. This is a very small you know, microorganism, uh, you know, one of the smallest eukaryotes, maybe uh, five to 10 micrometers in diameter. You can see this particular one, Bodo has two uh, flagella, there's one there and here's another uh, here. Um, there's a variety of different amoeba present. I don't know what this one is. I can't identify these, these types, uh, but this one I do know. So this is a, a genus called Arcella. And uh, the uh, people who work in treatment plants uh, often use microscopes to follow what's happening in their plants. And uh, they, they refer to these as donuts um, because that's what it looks like. We're looking at this one from the bottom uh, actually. And it, it has a shell, they're called testate amoeba, which test means a shelled amoeba. Uh, and this is the hole in the bottom of the shell that the amoeba can come out of. And so it, it you know, crawls around on, uh, you know, in, in, or floats around in, in the uh, system uh, with a shell on its back uh, as protection. This one you can see from the side, you can see it's really dome shaped. Uh, there are also a large variety of the more advanced um, protozoa, which are known as ciliates. They, so they have, uh, you know, little hairs all over the, all over the cell and sometimes formed uh, into uh, a ciri, they're called, when their cilia are fused together, form spike-like objects. And here, this one, uh, so this is Aspidisca, which is very common. Eupodes is less common, but I have a better picture of that. And you can see the cilia on the front here. Uh, forming a fringe. 
Um, they also fuse together into a membrane to push food particles down to the mouth, which is right down here. And then this one also has these spikes or spines that are made of fused cilia. And I've seen them walking around on these or, or using them like oars to swim or jumping like fleas even to push off a surface. And probably it also is sort of like a porcupine that these, uh, these uh, spikes can act to, to protect it maybe from a larger predator. Um, there's also uh, a number of different types of stalked ciliates. Um, so the most common type is a genus called Bordicella, which has lots of different species. And you can see that um, you know, this is an individual Bordicella. So it's a, it's a ciliate that has a stalk that attaches it to a, to a surface, in this case, to a flock. And it can close the mouth, or when it's feeding, it'll open the mouth. And since it's, it's attached to a surface, it can't swim around. Uh, but what it, it does do is beat the cilia in a pattern that creates a, sort of a whirlpool. And so a bacteria might be floating by and get caught in the whirlpool and then sucked into the, into the mouth of the protozoa. And of course, it can close the mouth uh, when it wishes. And then uh, Vorticella is one of the genera of these types of ciliates that has a, a myonine, so this dark line down the middle of the stalk. And you can see in the bottom two pictures here that here's, uh, here's an individual vorticella. And then uh, you know, seconds later, it's contracted the myonine to pull the head back uh, you know, to the flock. So presumably that's a defense mechanism. The myonine actually comes from a Greek word uh, meaning muscle. And that's the way it uses them. It, it, it presumably as a defense mechanism. And then there's also you know, several other a genera of stalk ciliates. Um, all of the others are colonial. So there, here's a, you know, a branch uh, stalks with all, uh, you know, these different uh, individuals as part of this colony. Uh, Epistolus does not have a myonine, so it can't contract. Uh, Carchesium, on the other hand, even though it's colonial, it does have a myonine, so, that, so it can contract. And then uh, one last group of uh, ciliates I wanted to mention are uh, referred to as Suctorians. And this particular genus um, has little, so it actually doesn't have cilia as an adult, as a juvenile it does, but as an adult it, it forms a stalk and attaches and then grows, instead of cilia, it grows these tentacles that look like they have a little flat disc on the end of them. And uh, so what will happen is one of the free swimming ciliates like Aspidisco will swim by. And if it bumps into one of these tentacles, this will use that little suction cup to hook onto it and hold it. And there's actually another species that has spikes instead that'll, that'll stab, uh, stab the cilia to, to hold it. And then in sort of slow motion, it, it'll put other tentacles over and, and hook those on as well. And once it has the, its prey you know, firmly held in place, it then sucks the juice out of it. And then releases the the uh, you know the, the dried out um, the dead ciliate. And I, I think by luck I actually caught a carcass over here. There also are uh, small animals that are present, and these small animals are, are referred to in general as metazoa. But there's lots of different groups present. Um, you know, there are rotifers, for example, which are interesting to watch. They, they have two toes, they have an intestinal tract, the mouth is up here. They'll plant the foot down, extend the head up, and then pull the foot after it. So they'll move along like an inchworm or a leech. Um, or they'll plant the toe down and then open the mouth up. And it has two wheels of cilia in the mouth. And it'll use those to create water currents to suck food particles to it while it's hold, you know, holding itself in place with its toes. Uh, or it'll then let go with the toes and can swim using those cilia and uh, swim around and look for food. Uh, there's also small roundworms, so they're called nematodes is the general name for these. Um, again, just small animals that'll swim around looking for things to eat. Um, they're, you know, aquatic uh, small animals. There's more advanced worms. Um, so, you know, annelid worms are relatives of the earthworm, for example. You can see the different segments here with bristles in between them. And this is Aelosoma, is this particular genus. And then uh, 
another small animal that you've probably heard of, you may not have heard of these others, uh, but most of you probably have heard of tardigrades or water bears. They, they've become pretty popular as organisms that can survive for uh, relatively long periods, uh, desiccated, and then you know, even after 100 years, uh, if they're put back into water and come back to life. So you can see again, intestinal tract, the brain here, that has eight legs, you know, four on each side. And if you look at the front right foot here, you can actually see some claws there. And so those claws uh, it would use in its normal habitat to you know, uh, hold on to the rocks in the bottom of the stream as it crawled around looking for food, for example. It, um, it does not use them for, for rending elk. And that's not where the name water bear comes from. Uh, it comes from the claws, but they're used just to hold on basically. And then here's a, a fungus. And we do occasionally see fungi uh, in these systems. Uh, this particular one is called Arthrobotrys, and um, uh, it's, uh, you know, here's the fungal filament. This is not very common, but we have seen it a few times. And, and um, it forms these special appendages. It looks like sort of like a lasso you might see in a Western movie. Um, and uh, this fungus tricks nematode worms, those small round worms, uh, into sticking their necks into this noose. Uh, and, and actually, it's pretty sophisticated. It actually releases sexual pheromones to attract the nematodes, to, uh, to convince them to stick their head into this noose. And then once they're there, it pulls the noose tight and strangles them. Uh, and that'll send a filament down to grow inside them and, and um, digest them from the inside out. And so this is sort of like a Venus flytrap of the microbial world. So why is this idea of my, uh, looking at these systems uh, through the lens of microbial ecology, why is that important? So as we said before, there's you know, severe competition in these systems and survival of the fittest. The conditions that are present determine who wins and who loses, but the winners actually determine how good the treatment process is. So it determines how good the F1 quality is, how clear and how low the BOD is in treatment plant effluent. And so it's determining the treatment effectiveness. And we've also learned over the years that we can use these organisms as indicators. We can look for slow or rapid changes in the system to see what's happening. And you know, once we get to know the, the players, we get to know when we see this particular uh, type of organ that we see rotifers, for example, that that means the sludge age is longer and that this system looks healthy. Um, if they disappear, that tells us that something uh, is going on and we better check into it. Um, so if we learn to recognize the organisms, we can, we can actually tell what conditions are occurring in the treatment plan, you know, based on our experience now. So let me just briefly talk about two problems that occur in activated sludge plants, two fairly common problems and how we can sometimes diagnose those. Um, so uh, the most severe problem that occurs is referred to as bulking. So imagine that we put our, uh, some of the sludge from a system from the aeration tank. We just you know, collected a sample of that and put it in a graduate cylinder and watched it over time. So initially it would look uniform, but over time, the sludge would settle to the bottom and we'd have clear water above that. And we expect within 30 minutes that the volume would settle down typically to around 20% of the original volume. If we have bulking in the plant though, what will happen is that the sludge won't settle well. So, you know, imagine that this was the settling tank we'd have sewage sludge all the way up to near the top of the settling tank if this happened. And that's the problem that we call bulking. And if we look under the microscope, what we find is that there will be excessive growth of filaments when we have bulking. And so it actually just physically interferes with settling. You know, this flock can't settle very tightly down or very compactly down at the bottom of the settling tank because there's all these filaments sticking out. And here, some of the filaments bridge from one flock to the next, keeping them apart, you know, preventing them from closely approaching each other in the bottom of the tank. Um, another problem that occurs is what's referred to as foaming. And you can see on the top of the settling tank, this thick foam is accumulated. And some of it's actually gone over the baffle 
and is then going out over the weirs and into the effluent and, and uh, you know, causing uh, this material to go out into the stream. And if we look at it under the microscope, um, when we have this problem, what we'll often see is this branched uh, network of filaments. And these are caused by bacteria in a group that includes nocardia. So we refer to these as nocardia-like uh, bacteria. And they're responsible uh, usually for this type of foaming problem. And so based on the different filaments that we observe, we actually can sometimes figure out what's causing the bulking or uh, foaming problem. We originally thought that there was only one type of filament. When I was a graduate student in the, in the you know, 70s, we thought that Sphyrodilus natans was the cause of bulking. But what we've learned since then is that there's actually lots of different filaments. And each one of these filaments, if it's present in excessive amounts, that means that it won the competition. And so whatever conditions allowed it to win the competition, those conditions are what caused the bulking in that plant. So here, for example, is type uh, 1701. We don't even really know the name of this uh, bacterial filament, but we know that uh, it does occur sometimes in excessive amounts and that leads to bulking. That's actually low dissolved oxygen bulking. And here's a, another type, which is pretty e easily distinguishable. Um, it's type 0041. So we can recognize these different types even if we can't name them. And so we've just given them these uh, names, uh, these numbers. Um, uh, Holiscomenobacter hydrosis, very thin filament that's perfectly straight usually. Uh, Microthrix parvicella um, is, is this coil type of filament, also quite thin. Um, here's Ferratos natans, the one that we used to think was the only one. And it, this is uh, unusual in that it has this branching. And then here's another very unusual one. Uh, this is Begiatoa. And the yellow granules you see here are actually sulfur granules inside the cells. So Begiatoa can use hydrogen sulfide as an energy source. It doesn't need organic matter for energy. Uh, it can actually use hydrogen sulfide for its energy. And it then deposits elemental sulfur inside the cell, which is actually another food reserve or energy reserve. Because if it runs out of hydrogen sulfide, it'll switch over and use the sulfur and convert that to sulfate or actually a sulfuric acid. Um, so that's how it, it gets its energy. And so based on that, we've been, a, based on identifying these filaments, we've been able to determine that there are in fact a, a variety of different causes of bulking. For example, low DO uh, bulking, or if there's not enough dissolved oxygen, DO stands for dissolved oxygen. Uh, you know, the Sphratus natans and 1701 and some other filaments uh, get a selective advantage and, and they'll grow in their proportion in the sludge and then cause bulking. On the other hand, if there's low pH, as another example, we'll get fungi uh, growing. If, if there's a high sulfide concentration coming in in the sewage, we'll get Begiatoa. So we're able to diagnose these problems. So uh, just summarizing again, sewage treatment is important. Uh, hopefully you now at least are partially convinced that it also can be interesting. Um, if any of you plan to go on to graduate school and, and, and do research and, and maybe even ecological research or evolutionary research, uh, one advantage of looking at these systems, uh, interestingly, is that they have such short generation times. If you wanna study evolution and you use giraffes as the animal you gotta look at, it's gonna take you a few hundred years to, to get your PhD. Uh, on the other hand, with these microorganisms, uh, since we can get many generations within a couple of years, it, it takes a more reasonable amount of time. Um, also, it's, uh, you know, there are sewage treatment plants in pretty much every uh, community, or you know, at least within every county, pretty much, uh, you know, throughout the US. Um, and uh, so it's pretty easy to go to a treatment plant. You don't have to save up for a few years and then, you know, book passage to, uh, to the, uh, you know, Tanzania or someplace like that to study the giraffe. Um, I'm not sure I would say going to a sewage treatment plant is as much fun as going to the savanna, uh, but that's a, a different issue. Uh, and there are still a lot of challenges though. One of the things with sewage treatment plants is that the conditions there are always changing. You know, they change from, from you know, year to year, but also from week to week and even within a day, you know, from hour to hour. 
Also, another interesting problem is that, or interesting issue is that if we think of a flock of you know, bacteria as being spherical, as we penetrate into the flock towards the center, conditions change quite a bit. The dissolved oxygen is much higher out here than it is at the center of the flock, where it might actually be zero. And likewise, the food, the dissolved food in, in, in the um, liquid uh, doesn't penetrate uh, very far into the flock before it all gets used up. Um, so that's an interesting uh, issue as well and, and gives interesting results when, when that's been studied. Uh, another thing is we don't actually know most of the uh, organisms. So you know, imagine going to Africa and seeing all those amazing uh, animals there and not knowing uh, anything about them, not knowing their names or anything else about them. So, so activated sludge is sort of that way now, and there's a lot of opportunity to really make a, a difference now. Um, so uh, with that, uh, just point out that uh, there are actually a lot of terrific careers in environmental science, and that's whether you want to get a PhD or a bachelor's degree, or you're, you're hoping to finish your education with high school. Um, it is one of the uh, you know, best prospects for um, um, employment if you look at the Department of Labor uh, before the pandemic and hopefully again afterwards, if you look for employment uh, prospects, uh, you'll see that the environmental field is, is one of those areas that uh, you, you might want to look at. Okay, thank you very much.